I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that is not legal. The latest Netflix sensation, Squid Game, is taking the world by storm. This worldwide phenomenon is a gory, brutal, at times humorous, gut-wrenching, and timely exploration of wealth disparity and human nature. But in addition to some existential questions, I couldn't help but wonder whether the show got the law right. Why are the contestants signing contracts to essentially murder each other? Would any of this hold up in court? Would our main character Ji Han win a custody battle to keep his daughter from leaving the country? Is slapping someone in public for money legal even if they agree to it? In this video, I look at this latest pop culture sensation through the prism of the law. Did Squid Game get their law right? Would you like to know more? Stay tuned and find out. First, let me preface by saying I'm not going to get into some of the more obvious crimes and other laws that are clearly broken throughout this series. You know, things like the murder, theft, embezzlement, organ harvesting, kidnapping, battery, intentional infliction of emotional distress. <laughs> Instead, I want to talk about the moments in the show that are a bit grayer and subject to some differing opinions. Starting with an early scene where our protagonist, Ji Han, runs into some old friends. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, they're not really friends. In this scene, Ji Han seemingly signs away his personal rights, including the rights to some bodily organs. So first question is whether a bloody fingerprint makes for a valid legally enforceable signature. Well the short answer is, probably. Pretty much anything can make for a valid legally enforceable signature as long as it's identifiable to the individual and it represents their intent to be bound by the contract. I would even argue a bloody fingerprint isn't the worst kind of signature. I mean, after all, it's pretty easy to confirm in court as authentic, given everyone has their own unique fingerprint. On the other hand, it would be quite easy to get someone's signature via a fingerprint even when they're asleep or unconscious, which may be why fingerprints are generally disfavored as a form of signature. It's also not as difficult to forge as you might expect. And after all, we do kind of leave our fingerprints lying around everywhere. But you also have to consider different institutions or parties can impose their own signature requirements to a contract. Whenever you make an offer, you can dictate the method of acceptance. So if you, for example, say, in order for you to agree to these terms, you must sign your full legal name in blue ink. Well, then if the other party signs in red ink and uses a nickname, you likely wouldn't have a valid acceptance, at least in theory. The key, the key point is that the offerer is the master of their own offer. They can set the terms of how or when you're supposed to accept their offer. Now there are situations, however, where fingerprint signatures might actually be more readily accepted, such as when a person has a disability or is otherwise unable to sign their name. It is common practice for individuals to sign using an X, for example, if they are illiterate. In South Korea, to my limited understanding, official documents are often signed using a stamp called a dojang, which has to be registered in order to be valid in certain cases. In the case of someone not having a registered dojang, I couldn't confirm this, but some of my preliminary research indicates that a fingerprint signature is a possible common substitute. In either case, it's very likely this signature could be legally enforceable. Keep in mind, not all contracts, at least in the US, even require a signature to be binding. Oral agreements are enforceable in many cases. Also note, different countries have different signature requirements, so this might not be the law of the land in somewhere like Europe. There's a much bigger problem here though, and that's whether this would be a valid contract with or without the signature issue. Well, what do you need to make a contract? You need an offer, you need acceptance, you need a meeting of the minds, you need consideration. So we have our offer. The offer to Jihan is to receive 30 extra days to get the money together in exchange for the loan shark receiving possibly the opportunity to get Jihan's bodily organs if he fails to pay by this extended deadline. So this also constitutes our consideration on both sides. Consideration is essentially something of value. Both parties to a contract need to be giving something of value for the contract to be enforceable. There's a big distinction in, in the law about about contracts versus one-sided promises. Promises are a lot harder to enforce because there isn't an exchange of things of value. But I don't really want to get into all that. It's a whole nother topic that I could talk about for days. 
So we have our acceptance in the form requested by the offerer as Jihan stamps his fingerprint on the paper and he does this actually somewhat voluntarily by asking about having ink to sign. In other words, he didn't accidentally slap his bloody hand on the paper, the objective intent to agree was there. Now meeting of the minds, or mutual assent in short, means that both parties are on the same page as to what they're getting into. If I said to you, I'm offering you a blue microphone, and I meant a literally blue microphone, but you understood that I would be selling you the blue brand of microphone, and neither of us knew of the other's interpretation, then there was no meeting of the minds. We weren't on the same page. There was a misunderstanding as to a material term of the contract because both parties had a different understanding as to what they were actually agreeing to. Now this is somewhat where the concept of duress comes in. If a party agrees to an agreement only because of a fear of bodily harm, and in some states this has to be serious bodily harm, then they clearly weren't in their mind subjectively intending to enter an agreement, despite the fact that they objectively agreed to something. Now don't get me wrong, this doesn't mean you could jokingly agree to a contract and then say just kidding after the fact because you never subjectively intended to be bound by the terms of the agreement. But if a party's manifestation of assent is induced by an improper threat by the other party that leaves the victim no reasonable alternative, the contract is voidable by the victim. A threat is improper if what is threatened is a crime or a tort, or the threat itself would be a crime or a tort if it resulted in obtaining property. I think there's no doubt that in this case, Jihan only agreed to the terms due to duress caused by a criminal threat of having a likely fatal nosebleed. In other words, there really was no reasonable alternative, meaning the contract he signed was voidable, if not void, depending on the type of duress. Usually physical duress, as seen in this case, would make the contract void, aka illegal and never valid to begin with. So next time the gangsters come to cut out Jihan's kidneys or whatever, he can say, hold on, I'm filing a complaint in court to get a declaratory judgment that our contract is void. I'm sure that'll work out for him. Of Of course, a contract can be void for other reasons, including if the contract contemplates illegal activity, such as selling your bodily organs. In the United States, the National Organ Transplant Act, which was passed in 1984, makes it illegal to sell or buy human organs and tissues in the United States. This excludes donations to a particular individual, which is why you still have cases of family members donating organs to one another. So if we establish that getting anything of value for selling your bodily organs is illegal, then the contract Jihan signed with his finger is for an illegal act. Contracts that require either party to engage in an illegal activity are void. It is safe to say the contract entered into by the players to engage in an unlicensed murder, gladiator, battle royale game, whatever you want to call it, is likely void as well since it concerns illegal conduct. The term that the players can't stop playing is a pretty clear requirement that they engage in illegal activity to fulfill this agreement. For the record, South Korea seems to have the same law as the US concerning the sale of bodily organs. To my understanding, under the current law, people can only donate their organs without receiving any financial compensation. And those who illegally remove or transplant other people's organs or introduce such practices can face a prison sentence of over two years, or those who illegally have their organs removed can face a prison sentence of less than 10 years. So if this is the law, and clearly these contracts don't really have any legal effect, why did the showrunner decide to include these? I'm sure he knew that they didn't make much sense legally speaking. So my interpretation and my theory is I think this is to symbolize how indebted people will desperately sign all kinds of one-sided agreements that are clearly not in their best interests due to their financial situations. Think of it like agreeing to open a new credit card when already deeply in debt or taking out a second mortgage. Desperate people will sign things without reading them, without understanding them. And although these are agreements are not as lethal, they are still often entered into under the same feelings of despair, and they still lead to devastating results. In some cases, these might be voidable agreements if they were entered into as a result of undue influence, which is sort of like a branch of duress. And it means excessive persuasion that causes another person to act or refrain from acting by overcoming that person's free will and results in inequity. But Unfortunately, in most cases, these agreements are enforceable and extremely unfair. So let's get into a less serious issue, losing custody of your child. In this scene, Jihan's mother tells him about his daughter moving to America and how Jihan could stop this move if only he could show financial stability. Well, not so fast, grandma. This isn't entirely true. 
In the United States, determinations of custody are usually based on state laws, but in most cases come down to the same basic principle. What's in the best interest of the child? So let me first look at this question by considering the laws of California, since the daughter is, after all, moving to Los Angeles. However, just know it is unlikely these laws would actually apply in this situation. Rather, South Korean law would most likely apply, but US law might be easier to explain. In the United States, a parent can have physical or legal custody. Physical custody pertains to who the children live with while legal custody pertains to whether a parent can make important life decisions concerning their child's upbringing, such as decisions relating to healthcare, education, and welfare. Generally, a parent who has a permanent order for sole physical custody can move away out of the country with the child unless the other parent can show that the move would somehow harm the child. While in situations where parents have joint physical custody, the parent that wants to move with the children has the burden to show the court that the move is in the best interest of the child or children. In other words, the difference is in who has the burden of proof and who needs to file something with the court. It's a much harder battle for Jihan if he doesn't have physical custody, and from what we see in the show, it would seem Jihan does not have physical custody. Typically, parents with joint physical custody spend about an equal amount of time with their children, although it doesn't have to be an exactly equal split. It seems more likely Jihan only sees his daughter on special occasions, and therefore only has joint legal custody, if that, and definitely not physical custody. Now according to California law, the mother of Jihan's child would need to provide notice to Jihan 45 days prior to moving so that Jihan would have an opportunity to object and to allow the parents to work out a new custody or visitation agreement. I imagine South Korea has some similar notice requirement as well. So if Jihan were to object, he would need to show that the, to the court that the move would be a detriment to the child, and the court would consider whether the move was in the best interest of the child, along with something called the la musga factors, uh, at least in California. So the court would look at things like the distance of the move, the reason for the move, the age of the child, the child's relationship with both parents, the parent's ability to communicate and cooperate, and the parent's willingness to put their child's interests above their own. The wishes of the child, if they're mature enough for such an inquiry to be appropriate, might also be considered. The health, safety, and welfare of the child would obviously be very important. Any kind of history of domestic violence or child abuse by either parent would be considered. The existing nature and amount of contact with both parents that the child has would be considered. And finally, the employment and ability of both parents to properly care for the child. So in other words, to make a long inquiry short, Jihan doesn't have the best track record, at least from what we are shown. The move to the United States isn't for an arbitrary reason, but rather for a new job opportunity. If the move was because the mother liked California weather, then there might be some serious doubts as to whether she could move away with the child, even with Jihan being a pretty terrible parent. So yes, if Jihan was able to secure some financial stability, it would probably help his case as to perhaps one of the many factors a court would consider. However, he still wouldn't have many of the other factors leaning in his favor, including the fact that he assaulted and battered his daughter's stepdad in front of her, which probably would really hurt his case. The irony of all of this is, even if Jihan had 40 billion won, he probably wouldn't win a custody battle because of his past and because his daughter likely wouldn't choose him over his mother, especially after she saw him punch her stepdad. I mean, it wouldn't take much for the court to start asking questions and saying, he's always beat up, he has bruises, you know, he assaulted the stepdad, and he pretty much has a terrible past history. So it adds a little additional weight to that specific scene in the rain where he punches the stepdad, because not only is that kind of a traumatizing event for his daughter, it also probably hurts his chances of ever getting custody. So also, I did some research on Korea's custody laws, and it seems the same fundamental principle of what's in the best interests of the minor child's growth and welfare is the key factor. So financial ability of each parent will be considered but is by no means a controlling factor in deciding custody. Especially because even if Jihan is a billionaire, he would still have to pay child support, in which case the child would still enjoy a relatively upper class lifestyle. And as we learned throughout this series, money isn't everything. Okay, I'm gonna make this one short. Most forms of gambling in South Korea are illegal. Betting thousands of won in the middle of a metro station, definitely not legal. What's even crazier, South Koreans can't even gamble abroad. Yeah, that's right. So, Jang Duk Soo traveling to the Philippines to gamble at a casino? Yeah, he could be facing three years in prison just for going on a vacation and playing a game of blackjack. Foreigners visiting Korea, however, can gamble, and there's actually a few casinos made just for foreigners in South Korea. Kinda weird, right? Which is sort of the story of Squid Game. We can see foreigners as the ones gambling at the expense of 
Korean citizens. Although things like betting on horses and other races is generally permitted for South Korean citizens. But these types of slap games are probably highly illegal, and the very covert squid organization sure is taking a huge risk by gambling in public. As far as recruiting tactics go, they could have done better. It makes you wonder, how deep does this whole conspiracy go? I guess we might find out in season 2. So the final scene I want to talk about is whether it's illegal to let someone die on the side of the road if you're just a passerby. Well, not in the United States and from what I gather, not in South Korea either. Unless you somehow cause the situation in which this drunk individual finds himself, for example by either getting them drunk or maybe kicking them out of a taxi or a car while they're clearly in no condition to care for themselves, then you probably don't have a duty to help this person. However, Korea, like the United States, has implemented something called a Good Samaritan Law to motivate people to help others without fear of lawsuit. So no person who provides an emergency patient in critical condition with emergency medical services or first aid shall be held civilly liable for the loss of property nor be held criminally liable for any injury or damage caused by provision of such services. And they shall be exempt from criminal liability for death unless there's any kind of intentional or grossly negligent conduct. So if someone was to come help the drunk person and they gave them for example an aspirin but they didn't know they were allergic to aspirin or something along those lines, this statute would probably limit their liability for basic negligence. Erwin, Erwin, Frank. No, that's a pretty tall order. You're gonna have to give me a couple of days on that one. <laughs> On the flip side, if you're a bystander who makes things worse without trying to help at all, such as this person who seemingly flips the drunk guy over in an attempt to rob him, well he'd likely be civilly and criminally liable if he got himself in the chain of causation of that person's death or injury. In other words, it doesn't matter if this drunk person was already in danger, if his situation was made worse because he was flipped by that stranger over onto his face onto the cold pavement, well that individual might just be in some serious trouble. But that's all I got for this iteration of Movie Law Analyzed. I'm still workshopping the title, let me know if you have something better or want to give me some editorial notes. Check out my other videos, don't forget to like and subscribe, comment, argue, question. Till next time, this is Reels and Gavels.